This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show. And this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, I've had a number of the Friday the 13th alumni here on the show. Um, and right now, as, as of today... Uh, Friday the 13th, Part 5, A New Beginning, just uh, outdid Jason Lives by having the, the most uh, interviewees here on my show. Uh, I've had, of course, Melanie Kinneman's been on here, Debbie Sue Voorhees has been on twice, Tiffany Helm's been on here, Ron Sloan and Corey Parker. Now we have the ambulance driver. Yes. <laughs> No. The, okay, the mental health driver. <laughs> we have Bob DeSimone. Did I get you got your last name right? No one does, so don't feel bad. It's DeSimone, but that's okay. Oh, DeSimone. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'll have to remember that. You're not the first name I've gotten wrong on here, and I always feel bad when I'm the host of the show and don't get it right. <laughs> So, so how are you making out with the uh, the fires there in L.A.? Because I know when you I first reached out to you, you said you were kind of on standby there. Yeah, we were. In fact, I live in Ventura County. <clears throat> and in fact, uh, Greg, excuse me, I've got a little bit of a head cold. So okay. if I'm sniffing and sipping uh, vitamin C as we talk, you have to forgive me. Oh, it's okay. Okay, good. You, you need to take some Fisherman's Friend. That's what I take. <laughs> well, I've, I've got everything else going here, so... I should be good. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I live uh, in Ventura County. I live in a, a city called Camarillo, and uh, we're not too far from the fires. And we were on alert for a while, but we're good now. The, you know, the wind shifted, but I still have friends up north, and um, I should say just a short way up north, that uh, are still hanging in. I don't know anyone personally that lost a house, but I have a good friend in in Montecito, who's um, uh, evacuated, so we're waiting to see how he makes out. But right now, they're still fighting it. It's a it's a huge fire. Huge yeah, fire. and here here we are in Canada complaining about snow. Oh yeah, that's what we could use. Believe me. <laughs> oh, I'm from a little place called New Brunswick, Fredericton, New Brunswick, in Canada. Canada. Have you ever been up this way before? No, I have not. But we will. My wife and I will be taking trips up that way. Oh, barely soon. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. Well, you know, you uh, we've got to start off here by talking, before we talk about um, your films, I want to talk a little bit about your music because I know you've got something going on. You're from forming a band, and, and this is a, a side of you I'm not familiar with. So um, tell me how you got into uh, music and um and uh, what kind of music you're interested in doing? Actually, first and foremost, uh, you know, I wound up in many different areas of show business, but first and foremost, I'm a drummer. And uh, I came to California in 66 uh, to play for, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Taj Mahal, he's a black blues singer. Yes, I am, yeah. Yeah, I came to California in 66 to play for him and uh, wound up, um, at a club called the Ash Grove, which was just about the number one club out here. Very funky place for up-and-coming blues artists and uh, folk singers and whatnot. And <clears throat> from there, wound up in the house band. So I was there for a few years. And I wound up getting steeped in R&B and blues. Before that, I was a rock drummer, but I always had a, a thing for the blues and rhythm and blues, and I worked with so many, so, so many uh, black artists. Um, I played with Albert King, um, Lightning Hopkins, Long Gone Miles, uh, Big Mama Thornton, Curtis Tillman, all these guys. And uh, I spent three years in that club, and uh, that really got me into the, uh, really steeped into the R&B and blues. And then... From there, uh, I signed up with a group called Country, but it wasn't country music per se. It was more country rock. Um, a lot of the reviewers felt that we were a, a cross between Crosby, Stills, Nash, and the band. It was a, a very funky country rock band. We had a couple of albums on Atlantic, and 
Um, we had problems with management and whatnot, <coughs> excuse me, and that whole thing fell apart. So from there, I went on to comedy, did stand-up, did some TV, and then uh, a few movie parts. And I think you know my brother Tom is a director. I do. I'm going to yeah. bring him up later, yep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and I did a, a couple of little things for him. And uh, then I quit the business. I opened my own business in 83. I quit show business. Uh, from stand-up comedy, I did TV. And then after that, I thought, i got to get real serious and get something that's steady. And started my own business, and it went well. And, and, and that was that. I, I really never looked back, except that Danny Steinman, uh, who directed Friday Part 5, he directed, um, God, what was the name of that film? Linda Blair, yeah. She, um, Linda was in that, yeah. Savage um, Streets. I, I played Mr. Meeker. Yes. Why can't I remember the name of that Sa film? Sa Savage Streets. Savage Streets, yep. thank you. Yeah. And uh, he liked what I did and said, whenever I do another film, I'd like you to, you know, I'd like you to work with me because I enjoy working with you. And I said, that's fine. Well, a couple of years went by and I quit. And my brother called me and said, that he saw in Variety that Danny was uh, shooting Friday Five. So kind of, you know, half-heartedly uh, I called Danny because I I really wasn't into performing anymore. And, um, you know, he said he was looking for me, calling my old agent. They said, no, he left the business, this and that. So he said to me, I have two parts left. They're small, but you can play both, but you have to figure a way to make – these two characters, one character. So obviously the the driver that took the kid to the uh, the place in the beginning of the film, I played that, and then of course I played the guy who drove up to the uh, the store to pick up Lana and uh, was blowing cocaine in the car. So he said to me, "How can you make these two people the same?" And I said, "I'll write the scene myself if you want." And he said, "Okay." So I wrote. Because it just called for Billy to drive up, yell for Lana, blow the cocaine, and get killed. Mm -hmm. But I had to make Billy the same guy as the guy that dropped uh, the kid off at uh, the sanitarium. So that's where I got the line, uh, the pride of the Unger Institute of Mental Health, who has just emptied his last bedpan and would like very much to party. <laughs> that made us the same guy. Plus the fact that we looked alike, that was easy. And I wrote her part and my part. And then in the car, Danny said, when you go to uh, blow the cocaine, he knew that I did a lot of stand-up. He said, just improvise. So they took the that car, they took the right door off and set up the camera. I jumped in the car, and they just rolled the tape, uh, roll, I should say the film. And uh, I had a good time. I had a great time fooling around in the car, and it, it uh, amazingly to me, this is, I get constant letters or emails, or it's amazing. It just really is amazing how these films have lasted over the years. Say the line. Come on, say the line. Which one? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the forecast is cloudy in the mountains, sunny in the valleys, and snow flurries up your nose. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea they were go supposed to be different characters. Yeah, well, well, they, yeah, sure, the guy just dropped her off, and there were no lines there either. The only lines were Tommy, you know, come out of the... And that was it. But when Melanie walked out, I was in character, and she's a beautiful girl. Yep. So while I was in character, if you remember, I was reading a, a Playboy magazine, <clears throat> so I was definitely a scumball, the character. So I kept staring at her. I didn't know if I was in frame or out of frame. So um, I kept staring at her and looking her up and down, and she stopped in the middle of the scene. And Danny said, what, what happened? And she said, he's making me nervous. <laughs> and Danny snapped his pencil and said, use it, just use it. So we shot the scene again, and as she thanked me and walked away, that's, when I grabbed my crotch, pulled my ear, and wiggled my tongue, and, and did that. <laughs> just, just, 
just to keep the tension going, you know. <laughs> going back to your music, you mentioned blues. I've had three of the Blues Brothers on my show. Um, have you ever worked with any of them before? No, I have not. No, that would be great, but I did not. Yeah. No. Well, I got to say... Um, Friday the 13th, Part 5, A New Beginning, I saw that when, of course, I would have been 13 in 1985 when that came out, mm -hmm. and uh, I saw that, that at a, a birthday party <laughs> for junior high, and I'm like, yeah, we weren't 18, yeah. <laughs> and I remember the, the, I hadn't seen it, but the um, other two that I was with had seen it, and they had said to me, they said, uh, we don't know. Uh, you may not like the movie because, uh, of course, they're talking about the fact that it's not really Jason. They said, you, you're going to love the leading lady. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I got to say, and I told Melanie Kenneman this, I said, but the moment she appears in frame, I tell you, I, I, I gushed. <laughs> <You found love. laughs> she is one gorgeous woman. Yes, yeah, she was. She really, and I'm sure she still is. I'm oh, sure she, she still is. is. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually still in touch with her. She was my first interview from the film, and I was so happy to get her. And I actually was talking to her this week on Facebook because her birthday was this week. And uh, Oh, it was? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. But she still looks good, and apparently she can dance, and she can, I guess she can apparently sing, according to uh, latest Facebook posts. So, uh, I'd have she, to check that out. But, you know, the kind of singers we're looking for are real gritty 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 blue singers so i'm yeah. not sure but then again i really don't know what what type of stuff she sings but we're it's really hard to find someone that can really sing the blues with feeling and rhythm and blues and we do uh <clears throat> a lot of the delta new orleans kind of second line music uh dr john type and neville brothers we do a lot of that and I, I do that not, not to make a living. I mean, I'm, I'm semi-retired. I'm almost completely retired. I do it because drumming is something that's just with me. You know, it's, it's always been my life. So it's, it's hard to put that away. Yeah. You know, I cannot act. I cannot do comedy. But I cannot not play drums. That's something I just have to do. It's in my blood. Yeah. No, but, oh my goodness, but, yeah, Melanie Kinnaman, a gorgeous woman. Um, so you made her nervous, huh? Say that again? You made Melanie nervous, huh? I made her a little nervous. <laughs> yeah, I did. And, and um, but after that, it was fine. It was fine. No problem. Yeah, I, I had a great chat with her. Um, uh, I, I love Melanie, and I, every week I always, always say something nice to her online there. But I uh, remember after I interviewed her, she sent me two beautiful autographed pictures, and I, I always appreciated that. <laughs> and um, But I know uh, Mel didn't have the best time shooting that movie because uh, Danny Steinman kind of had a little bit of a background. <laughs> yeah, the old Danny. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Apparently, um, she was uh, asked, I guess, to remove her bra, so she still had her shirt on, and I guess she come to discover why she was asked to remove the bra. I mean, she thought, you know, if her shirt was going to be on, nobody would see, but, guess, but I guess when the rain machines were on, <laughs> yeah, it didn't take her long to figure out what was really, really going on. I think Danny was going for everything, sex, violence, all of it, the whole thing. Yeah. And, you know, and, uh, but, no, I had a great chat with Melanie, but I kind of felt bad for her because, you know, when you go on to a film, you want to know what you're in for, but you don't want people um, doing sneaky little tactics. And I, I, I guess she was, I guess, a little subject to that. Yeah, yeah, there, I'm sure there was. You know, like I mentioned to you when you wrote to me that um, <clears throat> a lot of people ask me, what was it like on the on the uh, set and this and that and and the truth of the matter with me is I showed up one day to shoot the uh, opening scene mm -hmm. and then I showed up another night to shoot the uh, the cocaine scene and that was it I've seen the movie twice I saw it once at the rap party and uh, I saw I mean fully all the way through and then I saw it again um, when it opened. But since then, I haven't seen it. And, you know, there were years, 
years that went by, and I had no idea that this thing had reached a cult status. Somebody got in touch with me and wanted to interview me, and I said, for what? I mean, what, what exactly, the music or the the TV shows I did, the movies? What, and they said, well, Friday, and I said, really? <laughs> they said, yeah, are you aware of what's going on? And I said, no, I haven't got a clue. So um, <clears throat> he mentioned that it's, these films are a cult uh, phenomenon right now. And so this was probably 10 or 15 years ago, so I did the interview, and... Um, he emailed me a thank you or whatever. Then the email got out. I started getting emails, and uh, I said, sure, I'll sign, you know, send me something or I'll send you a picture, no problem. And so even today that I get uh, to my office, not to my house, I get all kinds of stuff to sign, posters, pictures, or just requests, and I send them out. It's just it has been really amazing, i got to tell you. It yeah. just came out of the blue. Yeah, no, I had Melanie on. I had uh, Tiffany Helms been on here. You, I know you didn't work with her on the film, but mm -hmm. of course, if you need somebody to to do the Cindo Echo His Eyes dance to your blues music, she'd be the one to go to. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, she does that in the film, where she did the the dance. Oh, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. I love Tiffany. I'm still in touch with her, too. Everybody from that film has been very kind to me. And, you know, Tiffany's been very kind. Debbie Sue Voorhees, uh -huh. um, I've had on twice. Yeah. Yeah. And Debbie was where I found out that you were on Facebook. Oh, she told you I was on Facebook. Well, she posted... Yeah. Um, I'm on her group page as well as on her friends list. And she said, welcome, uh, Bob... D um, Decimony. Decimony. <laughs> yeah. uh, You'll to get the... that right by the end of this interview, I'll tell yeah. you that. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> she said, welcome him to the group. And um, and uh, that was where I, I discovered that you were on. So. Oh, that's right. That's where I, That's when I heard from you, right after that. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Debbie's been great because Debbie put me in touch with Ron Sloan as well. Uh-huh who played Junior, and of course he's he's going to put me in touch with Carol Locatell, who played mm -hmm. Ethel. It's kind of a nice chain link, and of course I had Corey Parker on here as well. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I don't think he's on Facebook, but I did get in touch with him, so of course he plays one of the greasers, so everybody's been very kind from that film. That's good. That's good to know. Yeah. I don't think anybody can pull a real snobby deal <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, like a, a bothered star. No. <laughs> uh, Do you have any memories of uh, John Shepard, who played uh, Tommy Jarvis there in that back seat? I do not. <laughs> uh, only because he got in the back of the car. I, uh, the other guy drove it, and we dropped him off, and I never saw him again, honestly, because I was done shooting for that day. And like I said, I went back, um, I don't know, a week or whatever later to do the night shooting at... Uh, uh, at a place called the, the Rock Store. It's very, um, it's a very famous place. It's up in the Malibu Hills. It's not far from me. Let and, me uh, guess. You were that engrossed in the Playboy book. You missed John. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why, why, why should I bother with him? When I have that book. <laughs> why do you? <laughs> I said to Danny, I really have to read this thing. I mean, this is gross. <laughs> I mean, not that it's gross. It's just. You know, my first time on camera in this thing, and I'm reading this. He said, "Yep, this is what the character would do. You're that guy." I said, "Okay, I can be that guy." Well, what what, what would you need a Playboy for when you got as a woman as gorgeous as Melanie Kinnaman coming out there, looking yeah. all classy, you know? And yeah. you know, yeah, well, these girls were naked, and Melanie wasn't going to do that, right? Melanie doesn't need to do that. To be honest with you, <laughs> she takes your breath away the moment she walks on screen. <laughs> yeah, no, gorgeous woman. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you did the night scene. Now, that driving around the parking lot, was that you or was that a stunt driver? No, that was a stunt man. Oh, you can't take credit for that, huh? No, but I am a hot rod nut. I do love my hot rods. So what was that that uh, you were, I know, I couldn't, and I know it's not real cocaine, but what they have you snort? <laughs> Manit. It's a uh, baby laxative. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, and uh, I, trust me now, I just heard this, but that's what they use to cut cocaine. When they want to stretch it, 
they throw Manit because Manit is a little white powder, okay? And they would put it, dealers would put it in cocaine to stretch it. So that's what I had. Now, from what I heard, the rest of the cast had the real stuff, but, you know, <laughs> I was only there two days. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, it, my God. Oh, yeah. oh, my. Well, like most, most movie sets back then, I mean... Uh, it was rampant at that time. What was it, 1985? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's Manit. Little, it doesn't affect an adult, thank God. That would be a quick scene to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> well, your, your death scene, tell me about that. Um, well, I got hit in the head with the axe. Mm -hmm. It was a dummy, as you know, but... That was the end of it. They didn't, um, I had no uh, body on the ground scene. That was it. Once, uh, once he hit me in the head with the axe, I was out of the picture. It was all over. There was no cut scene or anything like that? Because I know that movie got hit hard by the censors. No. Um, that was it. Exactly what you saw was exactly what they shot. They, <clears throat> I would yell for Lana, and then later they got a dummy, put it in the car, axe the head, then they had me, you know, they did a shot of my eyes widening and all of that, and that was the end of it. So there was no more. I would have loved to have been on the ground with an axe in my head, but uh, it didn't call for that. Well, let's talk about Rebecca Wood Sharkey, because that was, of course, Lana. <laughs> and yeah, Lana. Of course, they couldn't get her away without her doing that little um, uh, breast flash there. <laughs> Did you interview her? Has anyone found her? I have not. Mm -hmm. I know Scotty McCoy, I think, interviewed you, and he's been on my show. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether he's gotten in touch with her or not. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Is she around? I have no clue. <laughs> but there is a story there, and I, oh, I'm i always reticent to tell it, but I do. Um this was a cold night when we shot that that uh, Lana scene, mm -hmm. and um, cold for California. So most of us were inside the, the restaurant while they were setting up shots, bringing the car in and all that. And my brother <clears throat> had recently shot a film with Ray Sharkey. Okay. And um, he called me up and he said, I'm at such and such a place, and Ray Sharkey. And I always wanted to meet Ray because I really loved his work in uh, The Idol Maker. So I always wanted to, just a chance to, you know, meet him. And Tommy said, he's here, but, and, and this was during the time when Ray was using a lot of heroin, unfortunately. Okay. And he said to me, I hope he's, you know, coherent. We're having a rough time with him as it is. So I showed up on the set and I was waiting, but I, it was useless for me to even approach him because he was, just completely out of it, and and things were moving very slowly because of it. So later, when I was at the store, the rock store, shooting that scene in Friday, I was talking to Danny, and uh, Rebecca, is that her name, Rebecca? Yeah, Rebecca. Yeah. Yep. She was sitting at one of the tables, and I was standing right next to her. Had no idea she was married to Ray Sharkey, none whatsoever. Oh. And Danny said, how's your brother? And I said, he's doing great. You know, he says hello. He said, tell him hello. And so I related the story I just told to you, that I went up there and that Ray was so whacked out on junk. It was very sad, and uh, it's a very sad situation. And she looked at Danny and I and said, are you talking about Ray, Ray Sharkey? And I said, yeah, it's really sad. He's just a mess with the heroin. And she said, Ray, my husband. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Danny and I just literally froze in our tracks. And she said, it's just a little problem with Valium that he had. That's all it is. And, and, and we both said, oh, f of course. It's, I'm sure that's what it is. And we were doing everything to get out of this ridiculous situation we got ourselves in. And uh, so th that was that was tough. It was it just came out of the blue. I mean, what is the chance of the girls married to this guy? Yeah. I had no clue. All I knew was her name was Rebecca. I didn't know her last name. You know, so. Again, not, lots of nice-looking women in this uh, film. Oh, yeah. And, of course, she was it. And, of course, that, that 
scene where she flashes the mirror there, you know. I have a feeling that, of course, was Danny's idea, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I really don't know. But um, I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> <laughs> I really wouldn't. Oh, Danny was really a sweetheart, though. He really was. He was a very nice guy. But whether he was doing that for his own pleasure or I would like to think he was doing it to put as much sex and violence in the film uh, as he could, you know? I mean, I think the body count in that film was the highest ever, if I'm correct. At, at that time, it did get surpassed. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. That's amazing. But, uh, yeah, I, I know that Danny Steinman had come up, uh, I, I believe he was making porn. I, you know, that I don't know. Okay, I'm... I'm, I, I'm again, a lot of directors do on their way up. They'll direct most anything. Well, I, I, I think you see a lot of that kind of thing yeah. in uh, A New Beginning. I'm surprised it did get an X rating with the amount of nudity. I mean, uh, Debbie Sue Voorhees, for example, is full-body nudity in it. And, of course, she's got a very good casual attitude about it. I, I, I like how she's, she, she, has, she doesn't mind talking about it and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Very, very level-headed. Yeah. But... Um, and then there's, you know, Mel- Melanie Kinnaman uh, would not do nudity. Um, she did do nudity in Thunder Alley, but I don't know why she had to do it, because it was kind of pointless. Mm-hmm. And so um, so in A New Beginning, I think she put her guard up, but I guess couldn't get yeah. by the wet T-shirt thing, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Which movie came first with her? I think. If I don't know, I could be wrong here, but I'm I'm thinking Thunder Alley. But oh, okay, okay. But she did a nude scene in the pool, and then there's a bedroom scene, mm-hmm. and I was like, I don't know why she had to do the nude scene, and um, because uh, a lot of times, unless unless there's a reason for it, it just comes off as exploitation, and yeah, uh, yeah. so yeah, I don't know. I I like Melanie, so I mean. But yeah, that 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 was her thoughts on that. But but then some people are are okay with it. Like I heard that Darcy Damazu went on to do Jason Lives, the sixth mm-hmm. one. She was originally supposed to be uh, be in part five, and I think if memory serves me, I think she had a, an issue with the nudity as well. So yeah, yeah. Well, so I think some people don't mind. At all, no matter what, what the script calls for. And some people will if it's really, really germane to the script. Mm-hmm. You know, but if it's just wholesale nudity, I can see where some people, mostly women, are the ones who get asked to take off their clothes would say, no, I'm not going to do that because it it's really has nothing to do with the movie. You know, nothing to do with the scene, really. But uh, I think what, you know, what really sells in these things is the sex and the violence. Mm-hmm. The violence in these things first, but then um, always a girl running, always in the rain, always bare breasts someplace, you know. Were you there for uh, Rebecca Sharkey's uh, uh, death scene? Yeah, well, I was still inside the uh, rock store recovering from (laughs) (laughs) the faux pas of the conversation. (laughs) But I knew she was out there getting an axe to the stomach. I knew that. (laughs) What was she like on the rest of the shoot? She was very nice. Mm-hmm. She was very nice. Again, like I said, uh, when you say the rest of the shoot, well, that was her only scene, if I'm correct, right? Yep. Okay, yeah. She was very nice. Just very nice. And so was Melanie. Yeah, very I nice. love and Melanie. No, nobody was playing the superstar. Sometimes on these B films, you run into actors and actresses that, you know, <clears throat> they think that they're already top drawer actors and actresses, and they're very uh, difficult to work with one way or another. But uh, the people that I worked with were very nice. You know, nobody was pulling any any games or anything. And Danny was really easy to work with. He really was, at least with me. I mean, um, he gave me the leeway to write the scene. He gave me the leeway to uh, all those lines in the car with the snow flurries. He just let me do whatever I wanted. He said, just... We're going to roll the camera, do what you want. I said, okay. He said, just end up blowing the cocaine. That's what you got to do. I said, okay. And uh, most directors don't give you that, that freedom. 
Yeah, you worked with Danny Steinman twice, also with Savage Street. Between yeah. the two films, which do one do you prefer? Um, I prefer Friday Five, and I'll tell you why. The first, uh, when I did Savage Streets, I played Mr. Meeker kind of a, like a goofball, mm-hmm. kind of silly. And it was good. They liked it. But then as they they saw the dailies, they said, we want this guy to be a serious teacher. We don't want him to be quite as, he was more or less, I played him like a stumble bum, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of a thing. So I went back and I did the scene again a couple of days later, played it completely straight. But when the place broke out in a fight, they used the character, the first character that I did, who was a stumble bum. So it looked, all of a sudden, it looked like, oh, this guy's overacting, you know. So they mixed the two, which I wasn't real fond of. But I enjoyed, I enjoyed Friday Five better. Well, your scene in Savage Street was pretty funny, though. i got to say that. Okay, sure. <laughs> it, it, it ended up you being the bunt of a joke, all right. <laughs> right, right. And see, because I was the brunt of the joke, I figured make the guy a real kind of a clod. Mm-hmm. You know, I wasn't I wasn't going over the top comedically. I was more of a stumble bum teacher, easygoing, um, the kind of guy you'd want to do that to. What they did to me with the uh, the big penis coming down in the <laughs> if that's okay to say. Any <laughs> sure, go or, ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to be the kind of guy that, that I'd be the first, I would be the target of the students, you know. Uh, but they said, let's try it the other way, and they used the the normal character. Uh, but as the fight broke out, me trying to break them up, it wasn't much, but the expression on my face was much more uh, of the other character. But actually, I, I bet no one noticed it. I noticed it, but most people don't. Well, but when when you're looking at your own work, you notice everything. Well, you got, uh, of course, Linda Blair and Lena um, uh, Quigley were in that. Do you have any yeah. memories of those two? Um, I knew Linda, um, not a great friend, but I knew her through my brother because she did a couple of films for him. Mm-hmm. But again, I'll tell you, my uh, my scene was that one scene, so... What most people don't realize, you know, they always ask you, what was it like on the set? What was this guy like or this girl? I don't know. I rolled in, did the scene, and left. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So uh, with Linda and I, it was just, hello, how you doing? And we went right to work. And then at the end of the day, we said goodbye. I saw her after that, here and there, you know, uh, but that was it. So working on that that film i really didn't have a lot of or both films i really didn't have a lot of interplay with all of the people um when you have one or two scenes in a movie and nothing else you kind of roll in do the scene and roll back out now with danny steinman between the two films uh was he pretty much uh the same or was he different in terms of his technique with both films um see here here's the thing again danny allowed me to play mr meeker in savage streets the way i wanted to okay okay? and then the producers or somebody said let's have them play it straight so like i said i went back and did it straight now same thing with friday he said make these two people the same guy write the lines that'll make it work. And then when it was time to do the cocaine, he said, have fun. So for me, Danny was a a great director that he let me do what I wanted because the scenes were really comedic. However, if it were a very heavy, serious role, I would rather his input so that we're both on the same page. Well, you know what I'm saying? He obviously had a lot of confidence in in you. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, He may have seen me at the comedy store. I don't know. He, um, oh, I think, oh, oh, that's it. I did a show called Make Me Laugh. I did 10 episodes of that. And um, I think he saw that or a reel that I used to send out. He may have seen that. So he knew that I was um, good at improvising and that I was very comfortable doing stand-up comedy. (coughs) Excuse me, this cold. 
Um, so he let me have my reign on those things. Now, if these were, like I say, other films where there was a dramatic scene and we had to work on motivation and so on and so forth, I really don't know what he would have been like uh, because he just gave me free reign, uh, which I enjoyed because both of these movies were they were those type of films. They, they were not uh, dramatically challenging. They were not meant to be, you know. They were your basic exploitation film. Well, you also worked with your brother, Tom, in a couple of films as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my brother, my big brother, giving me all the big parts. <laughs> <laughs> Is he still active these days? No, he's retired. He's down in Palm Springs, and he's uh, enjoying life. You know? Well, he directed you in a film I hadn't heard of until uh, I looked you up, <laughs> The Chatterbox, okay. <laughs> the description of that. <laughs> okay. You, okay, you want to hear another story? Sure. All right, here it is, and it has to do with bare breasts and everything else. <laughs> Just like what happened with Mr. Meeker, I had, the t- I had a tiny role as a cab driver. Yeah. Now, this girl, Chatter, the girl... Um, <clears throat> and she was a sweetheart, by the way. She died just a few years ago, I think. Okay. Um, she was a sweetheart. She was supposed to run out of the studio, the movie studio, out to the lot. Her coat blows open. She's naked underneath, and she hails a cab. I'm the cab driver who just saw this girl's bare breasts, and she closed her raincoat over it, jumped in the cab, and... Of course, I say, we're two miss and whatever, and we take off, okay? Mm-hmm. So they shot the cab scene first, and I'm acting as if I've just seen a woman's bare breasts. I'm, I'm a cabbie, I'm excited, I'm hyper, and I'm looking in the mirror, we're two, blah, 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 and we take off. A few days later, they shoot the scene of her, we're working backwards now, they shoot the scene of her running out of the building, And she decided, I'm not showing my bare breast. So what happens in the movie, she runs out of the building completely covered, jumps in a cab, and the cabbie's freaking out. Why? There's no reason for the cabbie to be freaking out, because her coat was never open. So it looked like I was overacting, you know? And, and, uh, yeah, I, I really hated that scene. I hated that. I haven't seen it, but I guess judging from uh, what you tell me, she kind of, I, I get it, she didn't want to be nude, but I mean, it's like, yeah. it's the same token, she kind of sabotaged the movie. Maybe they should have reshot your scene. Well, the, these weren't high-budget films, you know. <laughs> I suppose. I, my brother probably would have, but there was a producer on there, Bruce Curtis, that uh, just said, let's just keep going. And you know the movie's about a woman with a talking vagina. <laughs> yeah, so, you read I the mean, synopsis. <laughs> what's the problem? <laughs> with a pair of breasts, I mean, really. <laughs> Who came up with that concept? <laughs> My brother wrote the film. He wrote the whole thing. <laughs> and you didn't, and you didn't inherit any of. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't forget, I was on stage for many years doing comedy. <laughs> Holy <laughs> cow. Yeah. Well, that probably gave you lots of material, that film oh, alone. Sure. <laughs> but you also did another film for him, um, Concrete Jungle. Concrete Jungle. I think I played a cop in that. <laughs> yeah? I don't know. I haven't seen it, but uh, yeah. are, are, are you, are you uh, uh, blowing snow flurries up your nose? No, no. <laughs> But again, it's a small part. You know, I, I always, uh, between well, between you and I, we're, going, we're on the radio, for Christ's sake. Anyway, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> I think he always, he just didn't want me to, you know, he didn't want me to hop ahead of him. So I got these small roles. You know, if I was going to hop ahead, it would be on my own. <laughs> well, didn't you kind of hop ahead with a new beginning? With uh, uh, Friday? The, yeah. Well, he did a lot of uh, TV directing. He did a lot, you know. Uh, my success was in the music early on with that band. We did have a lot of success. I mean, we, we toured with, um, we played with the Bee Gees, and we opened for Linda Ronstadt. When America came here, we opened for them back in 72. I mean, we played for a lot of big people, a lot of big shows, and um, we, we just got caught up in the, 
management fighting with producers and the record label. Actually, they re-released the album in Europe, and it's selling. So um, that's something you may want to pick up. You can pick it up on Amazon. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> Well, Concrete Jungle had a really good cast in it. Jill St. Yep. John, Tracy Bregman, yep. uh, Barbara Luna, Sandra Curry. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, this is a film I have not yet seen, but yep. uh, did you get to work with any of them? Nope. I uh, I worked with, uh, God, I forget his name, one actor, and we had to do, I can't even remember what we did. I just remember putting on a police uniform being fitted for that and a couple of little scenes, but uh, my scenes were with this other actor who was, he, he worked fairly steady, but wasn't a big name. Nice guy. We had a lot of fun on the set, but uh, it didn't work with a lot of those people, no. And and I'm, I'm not sure. I think my brother may have written that, but don't quote me on that. He may have written that as well. So he didn't have any talking vaginas in Concrete Jungle? <laughs> no, not in that one. But i got to tell you, that's an enjoyable, campy film. It's very campy. Imagine what Pixar could do with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. He may have written Reform School Girls. Uh, that was another great film. Oh, yeah. Tiffany Helm was in that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tiffany yeah. had mentioned that in her interview, that she was in that. Yep. Yeah. And I'm not, I can't remember. I know he wrote Chatterbox, and he may have written... Either Concrete Jungle or Reform School Girls. And I think Reform School Girls was what he wrote. My daughter, one of, my youngest daughter, when she was in grammar school, the principal called me. Mm -hmm. And I and uh, Gianna, she must have been, you know, she's probably in fifth grade. And he said, I need to talk to you about you. And I said, what, what's up? Is she have everything? No, no, everything's fine. He said, but she's wearing a sweatshirt. And it says Reform School Girls. Because he, he never, I don't think he ever saw the movie, you know. He he said, and it says, so young, so bad, so what? He goes, how do you let your child dress like that? Oh. And I said, oh, my God. I said, I, well, I knew the guy. I said, Tom, I said, that happens to be a sweatshirt from a film my brother did. And she must have grabbed it out of my closet because it was hanging up, you know, and I hadn't worn it for years. It had been washed so much it shrunk. And she put it on and went to school. And it didn't mean much to her, but, you know, they went crazy. And I said, that's really all it is. It's, it's just a, it's a sweatshirt from a film called Reform School Girls. So <laughs> she couldn't wear it to school anymore. That was the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> Between um, uh, Concrete Jungle and, uh, well, I guess, I guess your time on chat, I was going to say which one you enjoyed doing more, but I guess Concrete Jungle probably wins that, doesn't it? For me? Yeah. As my favorite film? Yeah. No. Why, why would you say that? Cause it's no, bet brother. between the two, which one, between the between that and Chatterbox, but I guess... Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Chatterbox, yeah. Between that, it would be Concrete Jungle. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Another film I got to bring up too is uh, the Seduction with uh, Morgan Fairchild. Yeah, yeah. I that, play now. These are really small roles. You got to get a starring role. You got you got to stop getting. You got to tell your brother to get you a bigger role. <laughs> well, he's retired and I'm semi-retired, so my big role now is moving to Cape Cod and just sitting on the beach. That's what I'm looking forward to. <laughs> Yeah, The Seduction, I, I did that. Uh, I played a photographer. Again, another small part. Morgan Fairchild, I have to tell you, for somebody at that time who was a big star, was a sweetheart. She really was. Mm -hmm. Very kind, very uh, uh, helpful, you know, a real pro. She was sweet. She was very sweet. Yeah, um, yeah. She had, to, she had to be. Of course, this is a movie about a woman that is an, um, enamored by or. Uh, stalked by an obsessive fan slash photographer. Photographer, and, yeah. Yep. But I gotta say, I, I loved it when she turns the tables and just belittles him. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, Morgan Fairchild at that time was a big thing. Of course, this movie was up for quite a few Razzies as well. But <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Yep. Most of those are. Oh yeah. yeah. But. Um, uh, yeah, that was one of those cult films that you was involved in as well. Now, uh, 
we got to go back and talk about your music because you, uh, you said something to a, me a message I thought was funny. You said getting people together for a band is like herding snakes. I was like, oh. <laughs> well, you know, oh, yeah, we're back on anacondas and everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? It, it's, it's, um, if they weren't musicians, they'd be easy to work with. I, I, one of my, my brother always said to me, uh, being brought up middle class is a curse because he said to me, you're never hungry enough, you know? Mm -hmm. And we, my dad did well. He was in the restaurant. He did a lot of things, but he was in the restaurant business and we, we were never really hurting. We weren't rich, but we lived comfortably. And, um, so, um, geez, I lost my train of thought. I was just looking for another vitamin C. Oh, no, you mentioned that your father was in the restaurant business and middle class and you guys were not hurting. Yeah, but what was your question again? I got long, I got sidetracked. <laughs> yes, I, um, I, I was talking about your music and, I, and your... Oh, hurting snakes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay, I was yep. pushing a vitamin C out of the bar. Okay. Um, you know, they have... Um, me being raised middle class, I, and, and I guess I was brought up uh, I was brought up in your typical Italian family, both sides, mother and father Italian, you know, all the way. So we we just, even though I was a musician, I knew how to show up on time. I knew how to be prepared. I was well aware of when I went for an audition, when I was playing drums, to be prepared, to do your best, you know, and be on time. Mm -hmm. And... Some of these people, you know, it seems the better they are, the worse they are with handling their lives. They come with nothing but problems. The last band I put together was absolutely killer. We had a fine guitarist. We had a great bass player, wonderful keyboard player, still with me, and an amazing female singer. Just what I told you earlier, what we're always looking for someone who can sing the blues that really feels them or had something going on in their life that they can relate to when they're singing. But getting these people together for rehearsals, just one night a week, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, always a cancellation because somebody had something come up and it was just a horrible part of their life and the worst day ever and all of this rebop. It was. It was. I was banging my head against a wall, and I was footing the bill for everything. You oh know? wow! Sure, always. You know, and 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 then they wonder why they're not anywhere in their careers. Exactly. You know? And I would tell them that the way you were acting, you're not. You know, we did one gig and we blew the house away. Absolutely blew them away, and I just couldn't keep it all together. So I finally gave up and I started again with another band. Now, now I've got two other great guys with me and. What's taking this a little bit, uh, it's taking a little time, is that we're trying to find the right people. We're just not going to settle on uh, somebody that's 80% there. We want somebody that's strong in every position in the band. So that's, it's tough to find. And usually when you find that, you're going to have one of them that's a flake. Oh. Excellent at what they do, but because they can't handle their personal life, it messes everything else up with the band. Yeah, and the story I'm telling, if there's any musicians out there, they're nodding their heads. They know exactly what I'm talking yeah. about. You know, so. who are some of your inspirations musically? Yeah. Well, first of all, for drums, um, <clears throat> I go back far enough where well, Gene Krupa. I'm not sure if you know who that is. Uh, no, I don't. Okay, Gene Krupa was one of the great, great, great drummers in the 30s and 40s. Now, I wasn't even born yet, but as I was growing up, his records were still available, and if anybody talked about a great drummer, it was Gene Krupa, Buddy Rich, those people. Mm -hmm. They were my inspiration. And then my sister and brother, my brother's seven years older than me, my sister is ten years older, so in the 50s when I was growing up, they were listening and it's funny because back in those days it was called race music. Okay. They would get this station out of, I don't know where, Chicago or something they could get. Uh, and it was Symphony Sid. 
and he had uh, he was a DJ, uh, and he would play, he was a white guy, and he, but he would play all this black music. And in those days, it was it was taboo, you know. I mean, they uh, most white people didn't want their kids listening to that music, but they would listen to it in the radio, and I would hear it, and it really struck me. I mean, it really hit me. Um, so I was listening to all of these people. Uh, I can't remember some of the early ones, but then it moved into Fats Domino, Bo Diddley, um, all of those people. And then, of course, from there, when it got into the 60s, you had Chuck Berry and everybody else. But that's what started me off, listening to the uh, black singers and the black bands uh, playing what was called race music. Now it's called R&B and blues. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that was my inspiration. You got a, a web page you uh, wish to plug? No, I don't. I do not have a web page. No. Do you? Uh, okay. Do you have you have any CDs or anything like that out? Uh, well, I would plug <clears throat> if you go on to Amazon. Okay. And look for Slipstream. S L I P S T R E A M, like the old Slipstream trailers. Okay. Slipstream Records, and the album is called Country. Okay. Strange name. It wasn't my idea back then, but they re-released the album from the 70s, and you can pick it up there, a CD. I would definitely promote that. It's a great album. Okay. Very, very indicative of the 70s uh, country rock and country funk. And um, if there's anyone out there that knows of Little Feet, um, Lowell George played on one of our cuts. Billy Payne played on a couple, so... It's a good album. It's a damn good album. You and, go, of course, yours truly is on drums. There you, you go. How can you go wrong? You go get Melanie Kinnaman to sing for you guys? Sure. Why not? <laughs> there you go. I didn't even know she could sing until I saw the Facebook post. But she, I'll have to check her out. She was together with some people on Facebook. I believe one of the people was from Def Leppard. So. Uh, wow. Yeah, so she was in good company. So yeah. I, I guess she's legit. Yeah, I yeah. guess so. I guess so. I guess so, and she still looks good, too. And, and where does she live? Is she in California? Oh, yeah. Oh, huh. okay. Yep. I'll, have to, I'll have to check it out. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. You in touch with anybody from a New Beginning anymore? Or? No, actually, I'm in touch with a whole lot of people, like yourself, that do interviews, and, and um, they, they always, they're always asking me to go to these um, Con what do you call the conventions? Mean, you know, the conventions, yeah. Um, and I went to one out here because it was in Burbank, and that's close enough. And I had fun; it was nice. But uh, to pick up and travel and do all that, I uh, and you know, for me, when people ask for an autograph, I don't charge them. I mean, my feeling is, if you're nice enough to ask, I'm not going to charge you twenty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I just uh, the conventions are set up so that when you give someone an autograph, they give you twenty bucks, and I just it I can't uh, I I can't uh, it doesn't register with me. Oh well, that's kind of you because I would I'd love to get an autograph. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you an autograph. <laughs> well, I don't mind sending you a self-addressed stamped envelope. I don't mind doing that. Well, no, that's no problem. Just uh, private message me your address, and I'll send one out to you. Well, I appreciate that. I definitely okay. appreciate that. And I take PayPal. No problem. No, <laughs> no, I'd be happy to send one to you, Greg. No problem. Oh, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. So do I. Trust well, me, so do I. Well, I, like I said, I've got Melanie, I've gotten Ron, I've got Tiffany, and and uh who, who else so uh, from a new beginning so mm -hmm. and uh everybody everybody from that film's been very very nice to me so yeah i'll private and message you my uh email address sure yeah or my Your my mailing mailbox. address yeah, yeah. out of the happy to out of the films that you've done between uh chatterbots concrete jungle savage street seduction and friday the 13th part five a new beginning what's your favorite of the five my favorite film? Yep. I would have to say Friday Five. Okay. Because uh, I got to have fun, you know. And you know the funny thing about that film, Danny said, "Man, I I had parts for you, but I couldn't find you. Would have had so much more to do in this movie." 
And after the movie came out, I looked at it and I thought, I did exactly what th- that what I did in that film made me happy. I had fun. That was that. You know what I mean? I wasn't all over the film and in every other shot. Uh, my scene was uh, well received, and I'm happy. Well, you definitely stole the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Both times. Uh, for, for <laughs> well, that was my intent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you stole the, stole the moment both times, so there you go. <laughs> well, Bob, do you have anything else you want to plug and promote before we... Uh, no, actually, the, uh, I appreciate that, Greg. But, you know, um, when I mentioned to you through emails and stuff that, the, you know, putting a band together and all that, uh, that's just for my own pleasure, playing local clubs out here and shows, thing opening for people. But it's nothing, uh, I'm not looking to get back out on the road and do that again at this stage of the game. Um, it's just for my own pleasure. I will certainly stay in touch with you and let you know, you know, usually when we play live, we record the tunes and maybe if we have a good one, I'll send it off to you. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I play it on here. Oh, great. Yeah. Nice to know. Great. Yes, absolutely. In fact, I had an interview guest, uh, send me, a. uh, uh, a link to a track that he just put out and, uh, I played it Sunday when I was on. So, and they appreciated it. Mm-hmm. Yep, Great. so I don't okay. mind doing that. Yes, yeah, send it well, off to me. Grab yourself an album. Oh, you know what I can do? I'll email you one of the cuts from the album. Sure. Okay, I'll do that. That's, sure. That's for, yeah. Good. I'll, in fact, I'll send you a few. Okay. That that's... way, if you like them, you can play them. Absolutely, yes. Right. I'll, I'll do that. More than happy to. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. And I'll uh, get you my, my mailing address. You got it. Yeah. Before right. before I let you go, would you mind doing a plug for my show? No, not at all. Yeah. Hold on one second. Let me <laughs> hold on. I'm going to put the phone out for a second. Sure. Hey, this is Bob Desimone from Friday the 13th, Part 5, and you're listening to Python's Paradise with Greg Gilbert out of New Brunswick, Canada. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bob. I appreciate having you on. And, yes, stay in touch with me. No problem. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm willing to promote anything that you got uh, coming out. So Okay. Yeah. All right, I'll send you those. Uh, I'll get a couple of clips and send them to you. Absolutely, and I'll get my address out to you as well. All right, man. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Hey, this was a pleasure. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank okay. you. Take care, and I'll be in touch on Facebook. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Yep. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.